Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Susan Gay. I am the program coordinator for making connections for mental health and well-being among men and boys in the U.S. grant. This grant is sponsored by the Movember Foundation and it is coordinated by the Prevention Institute. As you know, June is Men's Health Month and as our custom is, we like to plan activities around this month to support our men's health and to let them know that we care. So this um, year, our campaign theme is Let's Hear It for the Warriors. And this is the first of first four webinars that we will be hosting. They will be every Wednesday in June from 10 a.m. to 11.30 um, a.m. Before our speaker go ahead, um, goes ahead and get started, I wanted to just um, point out a few things to you. Um, we will have a segment for question and answers at the end. You can use the raise hand feature as opposed to typing in your questions. Um, note them down on a piece of paper and keep them because sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the comments and be able to handle everything else. So if you can hold your comments to the end, we have 25 minutes allocated for question and answers at the end. And if you will use the raise hand feature in Zoom, then we will be able to see and acknowledge you. And at that time, you can unmute yourselves. Make sure that you are muted so that we don't get any interference or um, echoes that will interfere with the speaker's presentation. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. The speaker for today is Dr. Stephen Byers, an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Dr. Stephen Byers received his BS as a dual major in philosophy and psychology at the University of Tulsa in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He then attended the University of Michigan, Ann Harbor, um, Michigan, where he received his MA in psychology with a concentration in personality assessment and development. To complete his PhD in clinical psychology, he attended the University of Colorado at, Bo at Boulder. Throughout his academic training, Dr. Byers has emphasized the need to engage and enhance person's spirituality and related practices with psychological models of behavior, motives, and psychology. This emphasis was carried into his academic work via engaging peers, clients, and involves enhancing undergraduate and graduate education through his teaching at Northeastern, well, Northeastern um, State University. State University. Yeah. Thank you. He emphasized the importance of divestment and community research within diverse contexts. As a part of his emphasis on culture and diversity, Dr. Byers emphasizes the following domains through research and evaluation. Diverse students experience in higher education, re-evaluation of mental health concepts in relation to culturally different persons and both individual and collective traumas relationship to stress and coping in marginalized groups, families, and persons. Finally, assessing and assessing and examining collective trauma and mental health through narrative ther theory and methodology is his current research foci. The title of today's webinar is Reconstruction of Positive Indian Male Identity. Dr. Byers, welcome, and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch to PowerPoint here in a second and guide you through uh, what I put together today. And uh, I want to say at the outset that uh, I, although I've been trained in, you know, mainstream programs all along, uh, I've had to negotiate my uh, native and my male native Indian identity, and it, it didn't always fit in the training. And so, you know, when finishing my PhD and working with multicultural psychologists, uh, it, it pushed me into basically 
framing everything in terms of culture and diversity. So you'll see threads of that today as we talk. So uh, oftentimes I'll describe myself as a multicultural, uh, multiculturalist or a culture-based psychologist. So just, just getting that uh, be forewarned. And that, that involves looking at what the research has produced, uh, looking at the treatment models that have been engaged in and working with communities and individuals and families. Uh, taking everything and giving it a, a, a critical eye and uh, and a critique because most of what uh, my bias and we all have biases and I've been taught not to try and eliminate my biases but work with them. One of my biases is uh, I think it's a legitimate one is most of what we know about uh, people of color and especially uh, indigenous folks is through a, a Eurocentric lens and so as you progress uh, through your training and through your work. Uh, and then as I progress through these PowerPoints, you'll see a sort of, uh, you know, holding it up and then taking a little bit of a critique and seeing what we get. And uh, I hope to illustrate the reasons why uh, within this uh, discussion that we should all be reflective and a little bit transgressive. So here we, we find my PowerPoints here. And we'll get started. Let's see. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, I teach at Northeastern State University. Uh, that is the university here in uh, uh, Tahlequah in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I teach in the psychology and counseling department, teach undergrad psych, um, and then also help train LPC addiction and school counselors. So, and so I want to start out with a little bit of uh, uh, framing the talk. Uh, within this, the literature that I've been able to uh, pull together, um, here's, the, here's the transgressor critical part. Uh, and I don't think this should just be uh, the critical reflection and the cultural interrogation. I don't think it should just be with we academic types. All, all of us should take a look at the literature that's produced and the models and the theories and, and you know, pay attention to how they may or may not be applicable to different uh, culture groups and ethnicities. But uh, in preparing for this uh, presentation today, uh, I was, I'll be honest, not, not surprised, but um, a little a little chagrined that there's there's not been a lot on Native American or indigenous male identity in terms of research. Now that's not to say research hasn't been done in like anthropology, uh, maybe in sociology, but in terms of the research that we can apply to helping people and practice and evaluation, treatment planning, those kinds of things, uh, there's just not much out there. Uh, there are a few shining examples, one of which I'll uh, refer to in today's talk. But what you run into is a lot of uh, ethnocentric work. And uh, again, uh, that's why I say uh, we need to be critical and reflective. And so not a lot can be trusted. Some of it is blatantly ethnocentric. Some of it uh, is from what I call the privileged gaze. So you don't really get a sense of what indigenous folks uh, and indigenous men really uh, uh, are concerned with and what their worlds are like. Uh, and so we have to also then take a look at the fact that uh, we're limited here because much of what has happened to all indigenous identity uh, in the US has been sort of an assimilative process. Uh, and so my way around that is I consider myself a multiculturalist and a descriptive psychologist. It's actually a group of folks who are dedicated to reformulating and doing uh, research and treatments and uh, scholarly work from a multicultural perspective. And so what I did when I didn't find a lot of really good work uh, and such, I'm gonna rely on my own past clinical experience and present a case study to illustrate some of what I wanna uh, talk about today. But uh, descriptive permits you to look at what research is available and uh, sort of maneuver around it. And I have references for the Society of Descriptive Psychology. If folks are interested, they can contact me. 
uh, but uh, I, I won't go into that right now. Uh, but um, the scripture proposes that when we look at any culture group, we need to see that group or that individual as what we call a paradigm case. And I'm going to approach today, uh, today's talk, uh, as if we're looking at different cases. And a paradigm case is is constructed or is encountered, and it's a simple case study or a case example, but the methodology forces us or instructs us, I should say, to look for both the similarities uh, and uh, things that are not so similar and construct that into our clinical work and our research work. For, and this becomes really important uh, when we talk about indigenous male identity, because Indigenous male identity, I'm going to argue, has to be reclaimed because there's been a lot of assaults on it. Uh, and it's going to be different for clients who are here in Northeastern Oklahoma. I've worked on reservations in, in, um, in South Dakota and I've worked in different tribal groups on the Northwest Coast. So paradigm cases say, okay, what would this be like for a Native American male in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Oh, Here's the definitive aspects of the case. And now let's go into, let's say, Northwestern tribal culture. And we look for similarities, but we also look for patterns of dissimilarities. I won't go too far into this right now because I want to get to the rest of my stuff. But uh, yeah, I just want to point that out to you. And if you have time, take a look at some of the publications on paradigm cases, because paradigm cases permit us to focus on diversity and not uh, not distill things into these sort of reductionistic ideas that we often carry in, in the fields that we work in. And then P paradigm cases permit us to then pull out and look at different parameters that influence different communities. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. I just want you to know that's how I'm going to uh, come at things today so you won't be confused or unnecessarily confused. And then uh, notice I'm putting pictures up here and I do a lot of visual stuff, former art major and all that, but uh, you know, these are social constructions of, of men, the romanticized view. Oftentimes we don't think of indigenous men uh, as being biracial. Uh, so the pictures have a theme here. Um, but anyway, traces that uh, today I want to talk about the, the, the traces of research that do assist us. And again, largely much has been missed, much has not been done. Uh, but there are a few shining examples I'll share with you. And then again, if folks want to contact, I can send them the references for today's talk. So I want to talk about what research does assist us in looking at American Indian male identity. And then uh, I want to share a little bit of work that I've done uh, with indigenous men, men's group, groups in Denver, Michigan, and New Mexico. And I'm going to do that through a case focus, uh, an assessment uh, of an individual uh, who is, of course, his identity has been... Uh, uh, cloaked, so we won't, you won't know, have any identifying information. And so uh, that, that'll be the, the way we work this today. Um, and some initial commentary here. Uh, I would say that when the, the research out there, there has been a, a small amount of well done empirical research on American Indian male identity, but only as a, as a sidebar. For example, most of the research that I've encountered in multiple searches uh, across many years is around things like academic persistence, orientation towards science and math, uh, uh, health seeking behavior, and American Indian identity. And then they kind of control for gender differences. So that's not really a study of Indian male identity. However, we can call some important uh, points from that research. So. Uh, I'm going to be drawing from that here and there, but most of what emerges is this idea. It is a consistent idea. I don't like to give numbers, but a good 10 to 20 articles that are well done uh, have indicated that um, it's a myth to think we have all assimilated, that Indian identity is really still very strong. Uh, now, we don't always have the resources to support that identity or we don't access them. That's a whole other presentation, accessing resources and avoidance of them. But uh, I just want to say that in terms of the topical research, you see one study, for example, connected uh, identification with native values as a determinant of academic success. Another uh, took a look at health seeking behavior and found that American Indian men, again, no, no 
full-blown assessment of identity, but American Indian men will often uh, uh, persist with illness and not engage in health-seeking behaviors in co comparison to Indian women. Uh, and then they also found that Indian women in this particular study on health-seeking behavior and gender, uh, that Indian women often will carry a certain anxiety and worry that's a little bit different than uh, Indian men, how they how they carry worry about their communities. So uh, cultural identification and gender seems to be a, a really strong component out there in the mental health research. Uh, it's just not refined to the point that we can make too many too many mental health, behavioral health uh, inferences regarding. And so just to, uh, more on the research out there and uh, to get our terms in place, uh, identity in, in my frame of practice and my frame of research, identity functions to permit various psychological outcomes. And I tend to view one's identity, whether it be cultural, gender, uh, sexual orientation, wh whatever uh, different dimension of identity that's functioning, uh, it, it, it's kind of a self system that helps us to, you know, permits us to act agentically on the world, gives us a sense of meaning, it helps us to cope and adapt, and it helps us to find connection and intimacy. Uh, I don't want to plug for too many researchers, but uh, the NEO or the Big Five personality indicator research, mainly with uh, white Americans, but they did extend it to different cultures, indicates that this identity is malleable. Uh, and uh, through our 20s and 30s, uh, especially, but then after after that, identity kind of settles into a, a pattern, uh, unless one seeks to keep it flexible and uh, engaged. And so, if dysfunction sets in in childhood and young adulthood, it becomes more difficult in time to change and evolve and embrace, let's say, a positive female or male identity. So, if you have time, uh, it's really an enhancement to practice to take a look at the the big five research. Uh, it shows that once kind of a neurotic orientation to the world sets in, if you don't challenge it and consistently challenge it across your life, your life uh, span, uh, it's going to turn out to be problematic. And then the other thing we need to pay attention to from all sorts of research, uh, Native American, and, and many of us know this, but uh, there's, if there's been two things that have really, uh, two parameters that have really had a negative effect on our identities. And that's, we've been attacked culturally. And I hope I don't bristle anybody in the audience by using that term. I just don't see any other way that we could uh, 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 characterize it. But there's also, uh, and, and you know, that cultural attack has been through warfare, genocide, germ warfare, uh, and then also uh, boarding schools. I have, I have a video I want to show to illustrate that uh, on the boarding schools and just the devastation that it uh, incurred on, on Native behavior and, and identity, both male and female. Uh, but also there's another thing called cultural displacement and, and descriptive folks have done a lot of research here. And cultural displacement is when the identity the cultural or gender identity is, it's, it's constantly rebuffed by the culture that is around us. And so if one identifies strongly uh, as an American Indian male, and the research bears this out that I'll cite here in a few more slides, what tends to happen is that identity may be strong, may be moderate, uh, and there are ways you can assess that. I'll talk about that too with clients, their, their uh, sense of identity. But uh, if, if the surrounding, let's call it host culture, the US of A, if that's incongruent with your internalization of your identity, it sets up sort of a low grade coping demand. And here's the big punchline. Most folks we researched and worked with as clients, they're not aware of cultural displacement. They can articulate, some can, uh, many people aren't aware of, of indigenous history uh, or, have, or have avoided it or averted it due to trauma response and experiences. For example, my mother and uh, uh, her whole cohort, brother, my aunts and uncles on the maternal side, all were uh, victims of boarding schools. And it, it, it had a definite effect on me and my brother and sister. And so there's sometimes I've encountered clinically an avoidance of really looking at what our history is because of the trauma and pain. Uh, but it, people oftentimes can't acknowledge the history, the cultural attack, but they're not aware of how day-to-day 
the, the, they just don't fit. Their internalized sense of, of maleness or Native American doesn't really fit. And yet they're in the world, they have to work, they have to live in this world. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an incongruence and kind of a grading on that identity. And uh, that becomes really an important clinical focus. And I, again, have references for that too. Uh, all this to say is we're in a, an oppressive trajectory. And uh, I think that needs to be taken into consideration and uh, sort of worked into the counseling, case management, and uh, such that we do. And so for me, uh, in, my, in my graduate work and then recent research work, uh, there are dozens of definitions of culture. For me and for descriptive psychologists, we just, we pick a really simple definition. It's a way of life. But the importance of culture in constructing identity can't be overstated. Uh, I believe that identity is not necessarily genetic as, a, as much as it is socially constructed. And so uh, the culture is like these social collective codes or I parenthesize the rules, but basically they're prescriptions in how we get our basic human needs met. And so culture set up negotiations with the ecology and the environment, the systems uh, that we have to cope through and deal, or deal with and move through in modern culture and it, and it uh, uh, mechanized culture. And so it basically says, this is how you get needs met. Now these are socially encoded, collectively encoded. Like few of us have parents that from one to five, tell us this is how you eat. <laughs> uh, but they do teach us about what is nutritious or not nutritious. You know, a lot of times we talk about uh, food deserts now in our society. We certainly have one here in Tulsa. North Tulsa is uh, the, the, an area where I think there's one grocery store to 30 miles and such. And so uh, to negotiate that, uh, you, you develop ways to do things and, you know, where you go to get your groceries, how you have to drive. Maybe you, if you're poor, you get a group to go back into Tulsa and then to come back. But if not check, if not check, those become codes that future generations learn if they grow up in that community, uh, how to get uh, your emotional needs met, how to get, um, you know, your basic biological needs met and all the way to finding meaning and how to be a man or how to be a woman. So gender identity, as most scholarly uh, studies indicate, is heavily tied to both uh, culture and the social construction through that culture. And I think that's really important because when it comes time to doing work with people around their identity, uh, I, I routinely introduce these concepts uh, with clients such that they know where I'm coming from in terms of how culture works within them. And then gender codes and indigenous culture. Uh, there's a psychological attachment to a sense of who and what we are, and it is, it is gendered, and again, it's tied to culture. Now, interestingly, to me anyway, is you'll see here in a few, few slides, the research, uh, culture is still strong. It isn't dominant in the way that many of us would like it to be. Uh, because we have to live in a, in a non-indigenous world, our physical uh, livelihood, our health, our well-being is tied to working in an American system, or in the case of the research that was done in Canada in the Canadian system, there are economic systems that, that we have to partake of. And so um, this, this, this idea of who we are as Indigenous people or Indian men, uh, the good research indicates that it, it is still largely traditional. Well, let me stop. So here we have this, this dynamic with Indian men and women that they do grow up. It's almost like just a little bit of culture can go a long way. And so it's like if they grow up around a traditional elder or they have their formative years, one to five, and then let's say the urban isolator, the mom and dad, their parents take them to an urban area, that culture gets in there and it creates a, a, a memory and it creates, in many cases, a longing to be able to have that indigenous culture operative and supported in the external world. Uh, and so that, that's going to bear, bear itself out in the, re in the research I'm going to share with you. And so it is strong, but it evolves and changes. Uh, however, in our society, uh, we have a particular interesting thing and a horrible thing. It, it's been under attack. 
So, so when we come to Native American male identity and the few studies that have been done, uh, you, you, you have to keep in mind, and many of you probably already know this, but I feel like I need to say this for the presentation. Um, any Indian male, any, any Native American male has strength, is resilient, and he is also, and that person is also, how shall I say, uh, in, in, in the flow of a certain traumatic history. And when working with clients, how to balance that out and, and work that into sessions and helping them, uh, it, it, to me, are two key, two key foci. Uh, that the identity is strong, the client may be out of touch with it, uh, but it's still living in there. And then, you know, I can't, there are no recipes my mentors te have taught me, but just to have that in your heart and head as you work with folks. And then also that there is still a continued displacement and assaultive set of operatives on that identity. More on that later. And so Indian male identity, I call it reclamation work. There's been a cultural attack uh, and this displacement and it's limited the flowering and the flourishing of uh, the male identity. Uh, the social construction has taken in trauma, so it can't just happen naturally. And again, for, for, for men and women, but we're going to talk about male identity today. So there's been a resulting array of traditional and mainstream cultural influences. And when you work with folks, uh, I'm going to give an example uh, of an individual I work with. Uh, always keep in mind that a continuum exists. You may have someone who grew up with a very militant, uh, or they may be bicultural, uh, there's good research that shows in adolescence for American Indian boys, it's, it's often better for the parents to be cognizant and aware and decide, make a conscious decision to engage their identity such that they know what biculturalism is. Uh, or if you're going to raise your uh, genetically uh, defined native child, uh, to assimilate, then do that 100%. Uh, bicultural, assimilative, if you want them to be more strongly identified and uh, perhaps rooted in a, a strong traditional identity, then do that, although that sets up certain displacement dynamics. What you don't want to do around Indian male identity is be wishy-washy about it and, and not clear about it. And I'm not suggesting set up you know, curriculum in your home when you're raising your Indian male child. But the research is clear uh, on this young male identity that if they don't have a sense of how to be in the world and have a strong sense of either assimilative or how to live bicultural or how to be strongly native, they tend to uh, drift, as I call it, in uh, mid and late adolescence. And they wind up engaging in much more uh, at-risk behavior um, and um, injurious behavior and surely uh, a lot of substance abuse. So uh, regarding American Indian identity, how does one work with this group around their identity uh, or with their identity? And you know, everything indicates that gender is such a powerful determinant on health seeking behavior, uh, on uh, uh, just about anything out there to some extent is influenced by that interplay of culture and gender just about everything. So I, I'm going to uh, show a segment just to illustrate and get us on, on board with some of the uh, negative and corrosive effects on identity. I'm going to show a brief video. Um, and you know, folks often, let's see here, uh, we often, I'm always surprised at how often we don't pay attention to how the historical problems that we have faced as indigenous people are, um, how shall I say, encoded and utilized and working with people. So let's, I'm gonna do a brief video here and then come back to the presentation. Give me a second to get it up. And I'm not getting any sound here.
And this is on the one of the assaults on identity, the boarding school era. Are folks able to hear this? Could someone indicate if they can? Here, but when we tested it before we began, it played perfectly. So I'm not sure. We're not hearing now. You're not hearing? No, we're not hearing. We can see, but we can't hear. Hmm. Oh, why? Hold on, let me try one. Well, I tell you what, what I'll do uh, is I'll, uh, I'll make this available in the link. How's that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, we had it working earlier. So. Yeah, I'll just make that available for folks. And so. Dr. Stevens, I think someone mentioned in the chat that you may have the subtitles playing rather than the video. Okay. That would help. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me try. Let's try one more time, real quick. Okay. Now it's it's still not generating any sound. Okay, I'll make that available for folks. Uh, at the end of the if you will post the link in the chat and I will try to pull it up for you and you can continue and I'll let you know if it will play. Okay, let me let me post that to you. Okay. And the panelists are um, saying that you know take your time, we will wait. So that is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just uh If you put it in the chat section of the feature, then we'll try to see if we can pull it. Can you see it? Uh huh, yeah. Okay, and I'll continue with the okay. PowerPoints. Okay. I always think I'm a Zoom whiz, but something all like oh, this always occurs. All right. Yeah, so gender is a powerful influence, gender identity, I should say. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about how uh, some of the work, now this is not me, this is a team of us. And uh, hold on a sec. Okay, there's my video. Let's see. Let me move my bar. Let me know um, when you want me to try Dr. Byers. Okay, let me let me uh, get into the case okay. stuff here. Okay. And so uh, a great piece of research was completed in Canada, I believe it between 2013 to 2015. And they went in to talk to, uh, to survey uh, Indigenous men there. Now again, back to the paradigm case idea, how much of this can be transported or how much of this is operative in the US indigenous men, not sure, but that would certainly be a nice study to do. Uh, you know, when I say that, with the way research goes, maybe somebody's already doing it. But I want to talk about some themes that kind of live inside of, of indige indigenous men. Uh, so it's a survey research study, well done. And, you know, men, men talked about and uh, responded to the survey uh, that they, they want the ability to define themselves as Indian men. They, they have to, uh, they want to be granted that in any kind of services or group work. Uh, and I think this, that, that sentiment, freedom to self-define, connects to uh, the idea of the bicultural realities I spoke to earlier, because a lot of the uh, seven-eighths of the uh, participants indicated that they want the freedom to self-define because of bicultural uh, kind of a uh, double bind type of uh, cultural existence. So in other words, they're in, they feel like they have to be strong like two men, one in the dominant Canadian culture, and then it doesn't, what they do there to be healthy, strong and wise, doesn't always transpose into their being Indian men at home and in their communities. So I, thought, I thought that was 
really interesting. There was a strong emphasis on them defining themselves as Indian men in a way that they can help and provide for community and family. Now, you have to think about what's the reality of existence and what the sentiments are. So we're not saying that they're successful at this. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about some barriers here in a sec. Uh, they feel limited in this, but they wanna be helping engaged men in their communities. And there was a, there was a thematic outcome of, of uh, not dramatic, thematic, that, that they wanna be good, decent human beings. And I just, a little bit of commentary. In terms of mental health, let's think a minute about someone who wants to be these kind of things, be a good human being, connected, and the bombardment of the dominant culture, which is individualistic, it's not collective, it is materialistic. Uh, and so this, this, there was a sense from the data of, of men being caught between being what they want to be as indigenous men and how they had to cope and adapt to the dominant kind of capitalistic, individualistic society around them. Now, in my studies and in my own life, I've certainly felt this, but then I think back to what I began to read and research decades ago when I started study, that, that was an issue then. And I find it interesting that it, that it is still, still around now, that I, if I'm an Indian man and I'm strong, I also have to take into consideration this pressure from this dominant uh, framework. And then connecting this to culture, land, and community. My elders always, they didn't call it collectivism, but they really instilled me. And uh, uh, they talked a lot about being a steward. Again, didn't use the word, but you have to be connected. You have to take care of the things around you. And so I resonate with this idea. And again, this is men saying, you know, how they, how they want to be and what they, they, they feel like they work on. And then I thought this was uh, uh, a corollary. Uh, they, they talked about having time to actually create a vision of who, the, who they are as men and have it be free from all the bicultural stress so they could actually work toward it. Uh, they talked about needing more support. Uh, and then this is the pragmatic part of, I think, indigenous uh, culture. Uh, we, they wanted to construct the self, embrace the self, you become more familiar with the self, and they wanted to then be able to connect it to what they did in work uh, and, and their own self-study. Uh, they wanted to be an engaged, one might say, an engaged indigenous man in the world around them. Now let's shift to some of the uh, barriers that they uh, talked about. So in terms of, of you know, living their lives, uh, learning about themselves, uh, doing the work that they, they needed to do. They talked about the conflict uh, uh, between the cultures as kind of a double bind. And some of the items hinted at, or some of the outcomes hinted at a, a sense of how to be here, I think I'm repeating myself, doesn't transpose or may not translate into how I need to be there. So you think about how identity functions and how we can help clients with this, uh, it's helped them to acknowledge and explore what those stressors are. Because in my, in my opinion, a lot of times, one of, my, one of my clinical mentors would say, a lot of people, uh, what brings people to psychotherapy? What brings people in for services? And uh, that's one thing, what they can articulate. But he would always end uh, the, the lecture with, but most people really don't know what ails them. And sort of this kind of subconscious, not really being conscious of, what is the actual determinant of our pain and suffering, our mental health struggles, uh, our addiction issues. And I thought this might be one of the big ones, um, you know, that there's just this constant double bind and conflict. And we know how that can create a, a certain type of stress that can ultimately be debilitating. And then the men talked a lot about trauma, uh, dealing with racial bias um, routinely, some said constantly, and then, they didn't say this, and this is some interpretive commentary on my part, that uh, they, they kind of socially isolated. Uh, and they perceived that there was a lack of resources. So all this, the world kind of moved in on them. They didn't know how to negotiate this. Now, this is me adding an interpretation. Um, and so their identities were subtly and overtly um, assaulted. 
and the displacement set in and they couldn't negotiate these two cultures. And then, I, you know, there's a lot of literature on Indian men not seeking services uh, and not uh, taking advantage of resources. So uh, I'm not sure what the lack of resources, uh, if it's really the case or, um, you know, uh, if they didn't perceive them there, they didn't trust them. Uh, back in my early days of graduate training, we had a term called historic distrust that, that indigenous people tend not to go into the services that they need because, you know, if they don't serve you well, they're discriminatory, you can wind up losing your kids to foster care, things like that. And then another, another big theme uh, barrier was shame. And this, I, I thought this was so powerful. Uh, I, I also have this reference uh, for folks. Uh, it's, it's online, at least the summary reports, I think, uh, was a sense of shame. Uh, and they tied it to oppression. They tied it to marginalization. And, uh, well, I think that speaks for itself. <clears throat> and so uh, healthy gender identity for men. So taking what we know out there uh, in the research, uh, my team in Denver and then New Mexico, we, we came up with a model of how to work with, with Indian men, ran groups, um, therapy groups, focus groups to help, help get a sense of what men wanted from the, their communities. And, you know, he, here's what we came up with. And, and this is not exhaustive, but um, in terms of doing good, solid uh, psychotherapy with, with Indian men. Now, I must say, uh, this isn't research, but, you know, we, we tended to get favorable, you know, uh, assessments of the work we did do with, with the Indian men, largely in Denver, Colorado, and then in uh, Taos, Española, and uh, Santa Fe. Uh, you know, we get the, you know, how's treatment going, what do you like, what you don't like. So this isn't research, but they're tended to be favorable, but those are select samples too. Those are paradigm cases, uh, largely uh, Lakota Navajo men in Denver and then uh, an array of, of uh, tribes in New Mexico. But here, here are the components. And so uh, we frame uh, working to reclaim and enhance Indian male identity. Uh, you need to get a sense of how they view themselves. This is kind of a duh, uh, as being male and indigenous and make that a, a topic of group discussion, uh, you know, with your ground rules and good facilitation. And in individual work, it takes on a different flavor. Uh, and so basically my, my contention is we're not always aware of what ails us. Conversely, we're not always aware of where our resiliency is. We're not even come on, American, American culture, and that's where I was working at these times, doesn't say, Let, let's help you come to understand yourself and, and experience your maleness. Uh, it's the exact opposite. So the subversive thing became the subversion of identity and process and even familiarity with it became a challenge. Uh, and so we started to work with clients to actually pose questions, and then we developed a few techniques to help them come in touch with who they were as Indian men. And of course the therapy, the counseling, uh, the services have to be supportive. Uh, and you know, uh, you have to be careful not to project if you're indigenous or a highly attuned person, uh, counselor, social worker, you don't wanna project your own identity struggles onto the clients. And I'll be honest, that can be hard at times. And so uh, you wanna be supportive kind of, you know, control your transference or counter-transference dynamics. And then we also thought it was important, given the way the cultures work, the bicultural stress, that men wind up with a sense of uh, working on themselves, supporting themselves, exploring themselves, and using their male Indian identity uh, in a positive way, that they had to work on that throughout their life, at least the support of it. Um, and then there are ways to assess this. Uh, I'm a big fan of the orthogonal identity scale because it'll give you a measure of uh, how, how native you are. And, uh, and the, the model with that tool, the orthogonal identity scale is you're asked questions about your Indian male identity or your Indian identity, your uh, 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 connection with African American identity. So it creates a, a, a set of scores that show you where your cultural 
leanings are and where your white identity. So you can actually get scores that indicate a, a very distinct bicultural. Uh, I grew up in predominantly African American communities in North Tulsa here in Oklahoma. So I, I tend to score uh, moderate on African American identity and uh, probably uh, uh, I think I'm like a 0.7 out of 10 on Indian and 0.4 out of 10 on African American. So uh, assessing is really important, and that becomes a discussion point for your your, uh, your clients to talk about how their how their sense of gender, and there's also good assessments for gender too. And then, unfortunately, we have to engage the trauma. And I know it's real fashionable to talk about trauma right now, but it is a truism that, you know, uh, you know, the video depicts the boarding school trauma that that good majority of Indigenous folks. Have gone through so you have to do and this is where i become a narrative therapist let's let's do the stories let's edit the stories uh because i think narrative helps in a non-invasive way to elicit uh and you're there as the service provider helping the, the mental health worker to help them construct that narrative and also uh there's a whole set of uh writings and research on how one begins to edit and reclaim themselves from that trauma and so the goals of that model I just shared, we, we want to create an awareness and active working on the reclamation and familiar, familiarizing clients with uh, their male indigenous identity. Uh, again, given how powerful and important identity is uh, to help cultivate health and awareness, uh, many healthy and caring aspects of indigenous values and identity are apparent in there. Uh, a lot of us operate, um, you know, from that indigenous identity and while we conflict, we can actually get into some negativity about those uh, aspects of our identity. But really, in, this is subjective, I'll, I'll own. But, uh, you know, interconnectedness, collectivism, caring for the world, some of the research themes, that, that's a beautiful culture. That's a, that, again, we may not be aware of just how much that has been inscribed within us. Uh, and so we want to familiarize, create this sense of health and wellness. And then there are different things that we did. Um, I'm a big fan of rapid resolution therapy. EMDR is, is very helpful too, uh, but it has to be connected with the cultural aspects. And that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, but you have to grieve the losses and trauma that go with um, our cultural identities and our gender identities. Uh, one, one video I'll also share that illustrates you know, just just what happens. Uh, it's an interview with Russell Means, the Indian activist, and his wife, and he gives a beautiful uh, depiction of the power of women caring and the the uh, Indian male identity uh, and how how those two complement one another. But again, uh, a lot of times folks aren't aware of this. Um, so, and then. Uh, this is kind of a cautionary tale, and this gets into the transference, counter-transference you may experience, or we did. Um, there's no one size fits all. You know, some, some of our clients became social activists and were relatively militant about the struggles that the Denver community were going through, and, th and that's their thing. It was almost as if as they reclaimed their Indian male identity, they took that path. There are other folks that are bicultural, uh, and that they're not going to do that, and they're they're focused on how to cope across these two cultures. And then some folks, as controversial as this is within my circles and my family, some folks may be phenotype, look like the stereotypical, you know, Indian male, brave, whatever. That's a social construction too. But they are so assimilated that that's they have to negotiate their phenotype and appearance and maybe racist incidents, but. The flip of it is they, they've grown up largely with white values, um, secondary cultural values, and that's okay too. And, and that can get tricky because I tend to be more of a social justice transgressive person, but you just can't, you, you have to be careful and, and meet, as we say, meet the client where they are. Uh, and so to close this out, and I'm running out of time, I want to I present a case study and, uh, and I'll do a technique we did, we actually accomplished with this person. And... Uh, and so maybe just hold hold the video and um, you know we can just make it available later because I, I want to get this in. And so here's some defining aspects of this individual. Uh, I did a lot of work at counseling centers, so I saw a lot of of my Indian clients at uh, the the counseling centers I worked at 
on uh, campuses. And so a uh, 28 year old self-identified, boy, that's a whole other presentation. What does it mean to really be Indian? And, and we all know folks can self-identify and have lost touch or be fragmented, but self-identified, and that's always interesting to me. I always take that intake and say, hey, you know, how, how's this person identifying? And of course, when I met him, he, again, stereotype here, but uh, you know, he, uh, dark pigmentation, uh, braided hair. Uh, so he, he, he looked Indian. Uh, boy, I will stay away from that controversial comment. So anyway, he'd been in the uh, first year in graduate school. Um, he was coming back to get a PhD, but he was, a, I think he was a LPC at that time. So he's working at a outpatient clinic. Had been married for five years, uh, had a history of substance abuse, not active at the time we saw him. Um, and, um, uh, had used marijuana and cocaine in the past, uh, and had had claimed claimed to be. Uh, he did, he never said he you know was addicted, and he seemed high functioning and claimed to have no substance uh, usage at the time. Mother and father were removed from boarding school uh, for placement in boarding schools. Uh, he had good health. Um, you know he did walks. He he kind of walked to campus and such. Uh, reported that he was Native American on his intake. And to me, that's the conversation point to begin if you're going to do cultural work, identity work. And he'd recently cut off everyone in his family, uh, uh, I think on both sides. And But he stayed connected with his uh, grandmother, full-blood Indian woman, on the paternal side. So, so um, oh, I jumped ahead. I'm going to switch out and share a technique that we utilize with this individual. And uh, then we can close out here. And this, this is an oldie, but a goodie. And this is called the house metaphor. And I think the, the, the beauty of this technique and working with Indian, well, Indian folks, period, but with Indian men, um, and I, I tend to, I never, said I was an American Indian male therapist, but I tended to work with, with many Indian men over the years. And so the house technique is you, you have the client um, draw themselves as a house. And uh, each of the rooms are components to their identity. And you can go many places with this. It's, it's a very simple, beautiful, and powerful technique. I mean, this really, I did this in my own therapy. Gosh, back in grad school? No, before grad school, it doesn't matter. But um, a therapist introduced this to me and then one of my supervisors uh, utilized this too for bicultural work. You can do it with pretty much any. But the idea here is you can draw it. You draw your house, draw it any way you want. I once had a Navajo student say, I don't want to draw a square, I want to draw a, uh, a Hogan. I said, that's great, that's fine. So you can have some license in how you actually draw it. And you can have multiple stories, each page represents a different level to your house. But um, so it's a projective, but it's very therapeutically rich. And so this person instructed to draw the components of his identity uh, gave us this. And uh, I would say, put the core to who you are, don't define it, but this is your, you, you know, all of these feed into this core identity. And so uh, draw some rooms and uh, uh, tell me who you are. And that's kind of the first introduction of the tech. And you can do this in groups too. Oh my gosh, doing it in groups is unbelievable. But, and so folks list out the different components of their identities. And he put Christian, he wouldn't name the church. Um, uh, da, da, da. Okay, let me do this first and come back to mother. Uh, therapists always jump on the mother thing. But uh, Native American, lost, um, and you see here, these are what are these? These are things that are active in his identity now. He was married. He was a graduate student. He was a father. Um, he had a child from a previous marriage, I believe. Uh, he had cats. He had three cats. Uh, he was a son. Now, see, this is him generating this. No instruction. You, you go home. Homework. Next time we meet, draw the basic components of your identity. Nothing else. Just label them. Uh, he wrote confused, depressed, anxious, angry. Uh, and then here, I don't know why there are any, I, and you can assign. I said, well, I'd like you to, you can assign uh, components. I said, but for this work, uh, I'd like you to also put your gender identity, how you identify 
and then he put confused in there. Uh, strong, loving. So he saw those as components to who he was as male. Now, as we began to talk second, third session, he put mother in here because she was his tie to the, she pretty much uh, raised him as Christian when his dad did not. And in here, his main tie were with his grandparents to his sense of being native. And so um, you can also go in at, uh, in another session and you can place events in these rooms. You can, I just learned how to use my pen, so I'm going to actually draw on this and hope it works. You can rearrange the rooms in, in, uh, through the course of counseling. You can create, you know, little doors that open to different rooms. Uh, you know, sometimes people will put psychological states like shame, mainly connected with the dad. You know, so you have, this is a very rich way to explore identity. And uh, I'll leave it at that because of the clock. And so, let's see here. Oh, I always forget to share screen. Share the screen. Dr. Barnes, I believe we still have some time. Um, if people still want to see the video, we can go ahead and try to, we have it set up on three different screens. So we'll okay, okay. If you could do that, we'll, we'll close with that. It's, uh, let's see how we do. It's about 13 minutes. Uh, there's a part uh, that I'll just, I'll ask you to stop it at if we, if, okay. uh, if we can. Okay. So you okay. want to go ahead and go ahead and start? Well, yeah, the only thing I have left for us to do is to talk about uh, any questions or, uh, you know. Okay. Uh, but yeah, let's do the video. Okay. And again, this video is illustrating just one of the assaults. Uh, and it reminds us, those of us may know, some of us may, now we know about the boarding schools, but a lot of times folks don't. And I, I think it's a, a good depiction of, of the, one of the contributors to our struggle with uh, healthy. Can you guys hear I was adopted by a white missionary couple. I was adopted. I can. Place for adoption. You can? I can hear. I was adopted by a white missionary couple. I was adopted. Immediately placed for adoption. I was in foster care with um, one family for uh, 18 years. They were white. My parents loved us, and I understand that, but at the same time, they took the idea that um, they were saving me. Saving us um, from ourselves. Being saved, and I should be grateful for the life that I've been given, because any child on the reservation would give anything to live as I was living. They took us away from our mom. They came marching right in and literally took us and thousands of other children from their home. It's a way to er eradicate us. And to go to a nation's children is one of the sure ways to do that. The U.S. has a long and brutal legacy of attempting to eradicate Native Americans. For centuries, they colonized Native American lands and murdered their populations. They forced them west and pushed them into small confined patches of land. But Native Americans resisted. A Board of Indian Commissioners report said, instead of dying out under the light and contact of civilization, the Indian population is steadily increasing. And that was an obstacle to total American expansion. So the U.S. found a new solution to absorb and assimilate them. It all started with an experiment and a man named Richard Henry Pratt. He had in his charge some prisoners of war and he taught these men how to speak English, how to read and write and how to do labor. He dressed them in military uniforms and basically ran an, an assimilation experiment. And then he took his results to the federal government and said, they're capable of being civilized. So he was able to get this project funded. In 1879, the government funded Pratt's project, the first ever off-reservation boarding school for Native American children. His motto was to kill the Indian and save the man. What started there at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was nothing short of genocide disguised as American education. 
Children were forcibly taken from reservations and placed into the school, hundreds, even thousands of miles away from their families. They were stripped of their traditional clothing. Their hair was cut short. They were given new names and forbidden from speaking their native languages. To take our children and to indoctrinate them into Western society, to take away their identity as indigenous peoples, their tribal identity, I think it's one of the most effective and insidious ways that the U.S. did do harm to, to, to indigenous peoples here because it targeted our children, our most vulnerable. And they tried to make us ashamed for being Indian and they tried to make us something other than Indian. There are also accounts of mental, physical, and sexual abuse, of forced manual labor, neglect, starvation, and death. My great-grandfather went to Carlisle, and nobody in my family ever talked about it. So if you Google Indian boarding schools, the majority of the pictures that you will see will be actually from Carlisle. Colonel Pratt created propaganda. He hired a photographer to create those before and after photos to show that his experiment was working. So it was, you know, intentional propaganda. And it worked. The Carlisle model of education swept the country and led to the creation of over 350 boarding schools to assimilate Native American children. On the one hand, we have the Navajo as we find him in the desert. Few of these boys and girls have ever seen a white man. Yet, through the agencies of the government, they are being rapidly brought from their state of comparative savagery and barbarism to one of civilization. In 1900, there were about 20,000 Native American children in these schools. By 1925, that number more than tripled. Families that refused to send their kids to these schools faced consequences like incarceration at Alcatraz or the withholding of food rations. Some parents who did lose their children to these schools even camped outside to be close to them. Many students ran away. Some found ways to hold on to their languages and cultures. Others, though, could no longer communicate with family members. And some never returned home at all. By stripping the children of their Native American identities, the U.S. government had found a way to disconnect them from their lands. And that was part of the U.S. strategy. During the same era in which thousands of children were sent away to boarding schools, a number of U.S. policies infringed on their tribal lands back home. In less than five decades, two-thirds of Native American lands had been taken away. The whole thing was purposeful, and the fact that it has been buried in the history books and, and not acknowledged is also intentional. And in fact, the same tactics were used in New Zealand, Australia, Canada. All of these countries have acknowledged, apologized, or reconciled in some way, except for the United States. Over time, the brutality of boarding schools started to surface. And after a 1928 report detailed the horrific conditions at some schools, many began to close. In the 1960s, indigenous activism rose alongside the civil rights movement. And by the 1970s, that activism forced more schools to shut down. The government handed over control of the remaining boarding schools to tribes to be run in partnership with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But just as the boarding school era started fading, another assimilation project took shape, adoption. The main goal of this pilot project was to stimulate the adoption of American Indian children to primarily non-Indian adoptive homes. They claimed it was to promote the adoption of the forgotten child, but it was essentially a continuation of the boarding school assimilation tactics. And the strategy came with a financial advantage for the government too. Adoption was cheaper than running boarding schools. But first, adoption officials had to sell white America on the idea of adopting Native American children. Feature stories like this one in Good Housekeeping marketed them to white families. They were described as unwanted and adoption gave them a chance at new lives. In the end, their media campaign worked. White families wanted Indian adoption. 
but the problem was many of these children were not orphans that nobody wanted. They were kids often ripped apart from families that wanted to keep them. You still will hear stories today of people, you know, my age, older, saying, I remember as a child, um, the social worker was coming and people would hide their children. On reservations, social workers used catch-all phrases like child neglect or unfit parenting as evidence for removal. But their criteria was often questionable. Some accounts describe children being taken away for living with too many family members in the same household. An extended family is a big thing for Native people, and that means being judged for being in a house that's overcrowded. So it's always whiteness is the standard for success. And that everything else is judged by that standard. By the 1960s, about one in four Native children were living apart from their families. The official Indian Adoption Project placed 395 Native American children into mostly white homes, but it was just one of many in an era of Native American adoptions. Other state agencies and private religious organizations began increasingly making placements for Native American children too. My mother giving me up was a white person telling her if she didn't, she would never see her other kids again. In one of the documents I have, it's addressed to my biological father, Victor Fox, that he was trying to look us up to get a hold of us. But Hennepin County wrote, Daniel and Douglas are adapting very well in their new family. This was totally, um, it was a false statement. When you're adopted, you know you're missing something. Um, I think I've likened it to having like, when someone has like a 500 piece puzzle and they have all the pieces to make this pretty picture except one. My adoptive mother was not well verbally, physically and sexually and, and spiritually abusive. So by the, by the time I was 14, I started drinking. 15 drugs were added and I became an addict to numb, I didn't realize I was numbing pain. I tried suicide, tried slicing my wrist one time. Children were taken and believed like I believed for a long time that there was something wrong with me versus something wrong with the system. The Indian Adoption Project was considered a success by the people who set it in motion. Officials claimed, generally speaking, we believe the Indian people have accepted the adoption of their children by Caucasian families and have been pleased to learn the protection afforded these children. But the truth was unsettling. These hearings on Indian children's welfare is now in session. I was pregnant with Bobby and the welfare kept coming over there and asking me if I gave him up for adoption. Before, you, before he was even born? Yeah. They picked up my children and placed them in a foster home. And uh, I think that they were abused in a foster home. Four years after Native people organized in this Senate hearing, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act, known as ICWA. It gives tribes a place at the table in court. States would be required to provide services to families to prevent removal of an Indian Isn't, child. We can go ahead and stop and now to wrap was necessary, up. They would have to try to keep the child with extended family or another Native American family. Without our relatives, we cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So with Native people, part of our... Did you want me to stop sharing, Dr. Byers? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I mean, it's hard to conceive of anything but assault in all kinds of ways, physically and bodily, but also, you know, in, to help people, that's why I call it reclamation, to, to kind of come in touch with, you know, who you are as an Indian man, takes that supportive environment and exploration because it's been so suppressed and uh, and marginalized. So, but yeah, the, the movie, the, the video is pretty powerful. So uh, 
uh, folks can watch the rest of it if they like. But I wanted to say one quick thing and then open it up for any closing <coughs> comments or questions. Back to the guy we were working with. Well, I worked with him. Um, one thing I found, um, um, I was under supervision then and I sometimes miss that because these cases could be really complicated. But my, my uh, multicultural descriptive mentor, he said, let's find some things for him to do where he can live out his native roots in day-to-day -day activities. And so in his case, he, he became somewhat of a social justice warrior. And we talked about that openly. And he was able to you know, get in touch with his Indian identity, his male identity, and he made conscious, deliberate decisions to, to challenge institutional racism. He joined a Native American group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can't make those choices for your clients who are taught not to. Feminist theory would say you should help them to get socially active. But I think he found a lot of healing in, in being uh, in confronting injustice. And you know, we talked a lot about self-care and you know, not taking on too much. But uh, it just depends on the client. But uh, he, he, through the course of therapy that the counseling center, he did decide to take up uh, a position of fighting injustice in his life. So it, I'll close with that and, and uh, see if there are any questions or comments out there. Um, I have two you, questions. Sure. Okay. So um, the first question was, are these same themes seen in the transgender population with some uh, you were talking about. I would, I would, the things that I talked about today, now the research is, you know, they had the binary notion of gender, the one that done in Canada and the few others that are out there. But I would say the trends, the assault of the displacement, I think they're there also. And then I would click it up or I would, I would, I would bet clinically, yes and even more of a struggle. Because as we know, if, if you do any reading, you'll see that traditional indigenous cultures were very accepting. They had basically five definitions of gender. A lot of the, a lot of the anthropological data indicates, um, you know, the traditional male-female Eurocentric way, and then they had male two-spirit, female two-spirit, and then LGBTQ plus, and, but uh, through assimilation and uh, enculturation, uh, I think a lot of Indian communities, I know a lot of Indian communities have adopted a negative stance toward uh, transgender communities, but there are pockets of support. So I, I think the themes are there, but they have to be modified a little bit, depending on if there's a supportive group. We have, um, uh, when I was at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder, uh, uh, and then I ran an agency in Denver, we had uh, healers who were trans, uh, transgendered, and they found a lot of help and solace in the Indian community. But they also talked about a lot of discrimination and negativity too. The next question, what was the name of the identity scale you liked? Uh, well, there's one by Carol Finney uh, that you could look that one up under the author. That's a quick one, but uh, it's called the uh, Orthogonal Identity Scale, uh, OIS. And it, uh, I have a reference for this one also. Let me see if I can find it. Now, I probably shouldn't mess with this technology. But uh, Edding and Bavay, Gene Edding, O-E-T-T-I-N-G, and Ed Bavay, B-E-A-V-A-I-U-S, I believe. And they ran a, play, uh, a center, the Triethnic uh, Prevention, uh, Substance Prevention Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. And they came up with the OIS, the Orthogonal Identity Scale. They're different versions. And I should say that um, if, you're, if, you're, if you pay attention, and you should, to psychometric theory, uh, that was originally pilot on, piloted uh, on Indian adolescents, uh, male and female, and uh, but uh, as in terms of giving it and making it a conversation point with clients, uh, that you can do. But you, you just want to be careful because they didn't really extend it to adult males. Some young adults took it, but you can't make the same inferences psychometrically. But the bottom line is that's a beautiful scale in that it has how African American, how Asian American how uh, Latino, Latina, and how native and how white. In other words, 
it's it's a multiple scale, thus the idea of orthogonality. And uh, I'll add one other piece to that. Um, it seems that everyone can be bicultural uh, without much conflict, except Indian people. And uh, Edding and Bave found that you tended to not score really high on Indian values and identity scales uh, and white identity scales. So in other words, if you were Indian, you tended not to be very white or you didn't have that as a secondary identity. And they argued it was because of how distinctly different the cultures are. Okay, thank you. I have another question here. Sure. And um, it reads, this question is from a non-native individual. So apologies for any ignorance. Any thoughts on the best way to reach out to Native males with mental health assistance? Are there particular strategies or ways of messaging that are more helpful than what is typically used for the overall population? Yeah, I, I've had a couple of uh, site experiences with that. When, when I ran my agency in Denver, we pretty much um, kind of threw away the mental health model because uh, no one was coming in. And uh, I'm involved with the tribe, uh, project director with the tribe here, and we're, we're facing that issue again. Uh, but what we tended to do uh, here in Oklahoma and back in Denver uh, is we, uh, we held a lot of cultural events at our agency. They were Indian oriented. We had uh, quilting uh, room for the elder women. We had traditional healers uh, that would come in and, and be on site at the agency. And we did a lot of powwows and we did like a sobriety uh, powwow once. So we did a lot of community engagement and my staff would then be at those events, not as the professionals. Uh, we did home visits. Anytime we had a new baby <clears throat> in Denver, we would send out the health, the health care educator or one of her nursing staff. And then the social worker and the uh, mental health worker would go with her. And so, and then she would introduce them. So we kind of broke down the professional reference and the professional intake. Now we still did all of that. Uh, in, in here in Tahlequah, uh, before COVID hit, we planned a huge, it's called Praxis Need Assessment, where you do focus groups, feed people, bring a healer in, and they tell you what they need from, from the services. And, uh, but COVID kind of shut that one down. We were gonna do, um, we had tables we we're going to do at Walmart down in Tahlequah. We were just, hey, here we are. Here's what we do. Uh, please, we're doing video, Facebook videos now on what's a mental health session and how culturally competent the staff is. And uh, so, so, yeah, kind of a massive uh, community embedded campaign. Okay, thank you. Um, so you would, just, just to piggyback quickly, because I have two other questions. So you would say cultural, reaching out and using cultural practices or techniques would be the way to go to add to that. Yeah, and, and I, I'll add to that. Um, in Denver, we, uh, uh, how do I say this? We put together a, a community advisory board. So we had the regular professional board of directors, but then we had uh, uh, an indigenous group that also helped advise. And they kind of, they were set up to kind of steer the thing. Uh, versus, you know, the professional cultures and the professional groups. And that helps a lot. That community engagement is huge. I, I'd like to recommend Paulo Freire's book, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he talks a lot about how to, how he engaged uh, Brazilian, uh, the impoverished in Brazil to become more active and claim, claim what they needed from the uh, schools. Thank you. The next question. I'm a big fan of spirituality. In one side, I think it was Yellow Hammer that said, adoption feels of missing something. Do you think our spirituality brings the awareness? Yeah, I, you know, there were two things I left out of this presentation. And of course I didn't realize until I was wrapping it up. One is, uh, you know, doing programs and groups and making that a part of your your, your counseling or social work practice to help folks explore their spiritual roots. I, I, I think it's important that we, we get beyond the psychological and engage the spiritual work that, that 
I mean, we're spiritual beings. Unfortunately, psychology and social work and the programs we come from divorced from that a long time ago. I'm seeing people come around. I'm working on the manuscript now about what does it mean to do spirit care versus self-care? Because if you don't have the spirit grounded uh, and firm and self-compassion and love, you're going to have a lot of problems. In terms of indigenous uh, practices, we did sweat lodges. We did medicine uh, people came in to do sessions. They visited people at their homes to both get people reconnected to that and also to help them activate it and know where to go. So yeah, that's a big part. The other thing I left out is body work uh, in terms of doing counseling around anything, but especially when reclaiming their culture and identity. Uh, man, got to have folks doing Tai Chi, <laughs> doing walking meditation, things like that to get the somatic component in there. Oh, I can't hear you. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> to the next question. Um, this may seem random, but Carlisle was a platform for Jim Thor. It's my belief that Thor may be one of the most significant figures in U.S. history. Without Jim Thor, there would be no National Football League (ESPN). His contributions to male identity are in the collective conscience of most U.S. males and families because of his life. Although Pratt tried to kill us, he actually was a catalyst to our overall influence to a lot of, um, what is that saying? Something identity? A-T? Athletic, okay. Athletic identity. Jim Thorpe was having fun, not being violent. Yeah, I, I can only say I agree. Yeah, well said. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? If so, you can unmute yourself. Um, let me see here. We actually, I think I have a few more here. Slide barriers with learning. Thinking white is not routine. I am full blood. Okay. And then someone else said, very good presentation. Thank you. Someone wanted to know if the slides would be available. I told them that the recording will be available on our website in about a month. And you're free to check back with me. I posted my email address in the chat if anyone wants to reach out to me. But um, I don't know if that will be your take on whether you want to make this. Well, I, can, I can email you. Uh, the PowerPoints because the last PowerPoint actually has the, the video link and two other videos that we just didn't have time for. And then I do have a manuscript on the orthogonal identity scale I can send you, a PDF. So you want me to do that? Sure. If, if, okay. If, if you're um, okay with that. And That's then fine. Anyone that wants a copy, um, feel free to reach out to me at sgay, S -G -A -Y at sphb.org. And I will be happy to share um, the slides once I get them from Dr. Byers with you. I want to thank everybody for, for being here today. I, I, a long time ago, I, I thought, I actually went back into academics to basically do this kind of research work and models and then disseminate the information. Uh, so I'm really uh, honored to, to have done this with you all today. Thank you, Dr. Byers. To close, I just want to... Um, encourage you to join us again next week. Um, we will have another webinar and the title is Listening to the Voices of Young Indigenous Males about their health and well-being lessons from the Northern Territory in Australia. Um, and um, our presenter will be um, from Australia, Professor James Smith. He's currently um, a Phil Bright Scholar here in the US, um, but he'll be going back to Australia soon. So we can compare how native males in America, um, some of the things that they're experiencing and going through, and we can learn about other males, in, in indigenous males in different parts of the, the world. So I invite you to join us. Please register for that. Um, we sent out a link via our listserv, or it will be posted on our website on the trainings page. I just want to thank Dr. Byers so much for um, his willingness to present and sharing his expertise and knowledge with us today. I want to thank all of you participants for joining us. And I want to thank everyone that made it possible. 
Uh, my co-worker, Idalmi de Guignon, uh, we worked hard on trying to put this together. So I want to thank her publicly and personally, and also our creative um, services department, and Ardi and Yanavia. We are a team here, so we work as a team. So I want to thank you all, and stay tuned for next week. Thank you. Okay. So I will close up with, I think I see, let me see here. Um, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Okay. All right.